Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to My First Business, the podcast. I'm your host, Naeem Parvez, and I'm a relatively new and sometimes clueless business owner. And I wanted to talk to other entrepreneurs to help guide me and inspire me and help me to understand the best way to grow my own business. So now I know you may be in the same boat. You might want to learn about what mistakes to avoid, how to overcome common challenges, how to identify new opportunities. And that's why I created this show for you, my dear audience. So if you're thinking of going out on your own or running a new business or an old one, I don't care. I'm not an ageist. I bring on guests from all sorts of industries and they're full of wisdom that you'll chew right up. And each episode is going to be like a conversation with a mentor that you never had. My guest today is Jad. Jad is the founder and CEO of Pangea X, which is a digital platform that aims to bring together the world's best data analysts and data science freelancers from across the world onto a single platform and open them up to a multitude of job opportunities while also helping companies to cut straight through the noise and get to the most qualified people they could ask for. Jad is a passionate data analytics professional with over five years of experience in risk advisory management across multiple sectors and industries. Prior to launching Pangea X, Jad spent over three years as a consultant with Deloitte, where he specialized in data analytics, software asset management across the Middle East region. Wow. He's, he's also served as the head of data analytics department for Aero Maritime, to a security and defense consulting firm where he was instrumental in getting them to expand into the analytics industry. Jad holds a bachelor's in computer science from Queen Mary University in London and a degree in uh, business and managerial economics from LSC. And if that wasn't enough, he also speaks three languages fluently, French, English, and Spanish, which is the three languages we're going to be interchanging in this conversation. Great. Actually, no, I'm kidding. My French is worse than my Spanish, and my <laughs> Spanish is non-existent. Nice. <laughs> Welcome, Jad. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, there's a lot of place that we can, uh, we can start these, uh, these little conversations we're going to have, but... There's one thing that I've started noticing, especially in my previous guest as well. There is an exodus of ex-consultants that go into entrepreneurship. And I've always kind of won now started wondering, like, what is it about that industry that spawns this new generation of entrepreneurs? That there's something I'm missing there. I don't know what the percent is. I don't know how many businesses are started by ex-consultant or percentage. But what do you think it is? Do you think this do is you want the truth or the, the, the filtered version? The absolute, the absolute truth. So, like, maybe phrase it this way, right? Um, now nah, I won't tell you how to phrase it, but I'm thinking of this way: Are you running from something, or are you running our, towards something? Our life is so miserable that we have to. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> basically, it's because I think we're we're exposed to a multitude of different things. We're we're exposed to different industries. We're we're exposed to different uh, different clients, different uh, different verticals. So. We, it gives us the, the ability to think, to think on our feet, to think of what could I, what could I create to, to make this better? What, what can I do? Is there a gap here that I could be filling? Is the, it, it, it gives us a, a lot of, a lot of uh, let's say, uh, like we can see a lot of things. So it's not, it's not that we're, we're only concentrating on one little vertical. When you're auditing a, a firm or a client, you, you see everything. You see their ins and outs. You see their their sales. You see their their marketing department. You see absolutely everything. So that gets you thinking. I think that's why I think a lot of us just transition and try and create something to to fill a gap that we've seen. Yeah, I think what is I had a. It's very hard to say again. No filter, but I didn't respect consultants before. Uh, the Nobody thinking, does. the thinking that I had in my mind was very specific around skin in the game, right? Okay. You are responsible for giving advice for which the consequences you may not suffer fully from. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought of it like a long time like that. Said, okay. uh, until one of the guests actually changed my mind. And he said, these people are out there learning about every single business, every industry. They're reading books about it. They are so far deep into it that you can't ever be yeah. into a multitude of variety of businesses. Why not take their knowledge? 100%. And apply, apply whatever you want to apply. But if they're, and from what you're saying, is having that kind of bird's eye view and also rat's eye view of everything. I, I, I agree with your, with your statement, maybe 50-50, mm -hmm. in the sense of, yes, you can trust consultants, not because they have skin in the game, but because they know so much, fine. But consulting firms is, mm -hmm. the, is the problem. At least in my eyes, consulting firms are the problem because a lot of the clients are always going to consulting firms for their name. Mm -hmm. Right when uh, when you want to go, uh, 
I always take this example. When you want to go shopping, you, if you're into brands, you'll go to a brand. But a dress is a dress, right? A shirt is a shirt. doesn't matter what it says on the, the, the logo. So that's my point behind uh, my business. It's about the consultant's skill. It's about the consultant's quality. It's not about uh, the brand that you represent, whether it's a big four firm or uh, any other firm. Mm -hmm. that's, that's not what counts. It's the quality that's in your mind and the quality that uh, comes through knowledge. Yeah. So I do agree with you that, yes, uh, consultants do have a, no a lot of knowledge. They don't have skin in the game. However, uh, they don't have skin in the game because they work for a multi-billion dollar uh, mm -hmm. big house consulting firm. But maybe it's even better sometimes to not have skin in the game. And this is going against my personal philosophy, but having an objective look at something where you can be a bit more blunt. Like the relationship doesn't matter as much to you with a client. You want to tell them the truth as, mm -hmm. as nobody would. 100%. And sometimes you're not a prophet in your own land, right? So you might have met entrepreneurs that are, let's say, running family businesses, but no one is saying the truth to each other because mm -hmm. it's my brother or it's my wife. And yeah. like, you know, I've known this partner for 20 years and mm -hmm. I don't want to tell them that they're crap or shit. Uh, and the consultant's job then becomes to be the truth sayer at that point. I mean, yeah, but we, uh, I don't think we should generalize. I yeah. mean, for, for example, my family, I, I used to bring a lot of these uh, little ideas when I'm, in, uh, when I'm in university. I'm thinking of ideas, business ideas or app ideas, because that's what I studied, uh, computer science. So I was thinking about developing something, a game or an app or something, you know. And most of the time I would go to my family and they would be brutally honest with me, which I appreciate. They'd, they'd tell me straight up, your idea is shit. Yeah. Reassess your life. Like, what are you doing? No. <laughs> I love it. You know, but that that's how I knew I had something when I started this business because the people that were my devil's advocate were actually behind me. They were like, you know what? You're onto something. Mm -hmm. You know, back it up with data, back it up with the, with research and whatnot, but you're onto something. This is not a, a childish uh, thought or a business idea. You've actually thought this through and it, it really could turn into something. Yeah, it's just not a, a pie in the sky anymore. Hmm. Let me ask you some one last question about going from consultant to entrepreneur to a part of that, again, you can clarify this for me, but I also feel, and this is like personal experience, we were talking about this before we started rolling, hmm. but where I was working in a salary job and when you were working, the money was good. Yeah. And what part of that helps with the capital for starting your own venture too? Because I think there's a bit of decent amount to fall back on if things don't pan out would there would that would that be a common thread amongst other consultants that you know that have started their own businesses like being able to leverage the savings or the capital that they've had no not necessarily because uh at least my circle my circle of uh, of people consultants here at least in dubai mm -hmm. i'm going to be very blunt we're not paid well especially when you're starting off, we're not paid well. It's not like I put plenty of money on the side and was able to, 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 to have a bunch of savings and uh, before I started this business. No, not at all. I, I think there's two different types of people. Maybe uh, people that had a salary job and their, their salary was great and they took the leap of faith. And then other people, you know, other wanna, entrepreneurs that want to start something up and they don't have the capital. They don't have the, the, the savings from their previous job. Maybe they have it through uh, any other how, you know, whether it's family or they have investors or an angel investor or whatever it is. I, we, I don't think it's fair to say that uh, most op no, entrepreneurs that were consultant probably saved up most of their money and then started their business once they reached that amount of money that they were looking for. Not here, at least. Good. I'm, I'm good. I asked an ex-consultant that question to know, know the full truth. I'm going to go a few years back, mm. a few decades back. Okay. You started working at your mom's bakery in yes, Spain, sir. right? Yes, Around uh, 13, 14 years old. Mm -hmm. I want you to maybe in hindsight and see if you can connect the dots to some of the things that you were learning. Because I know you had a fun experience, not in just one role. You kind of moved around there too. Are there any dots that you think you've connected from that time of the way things were run, what the machine was built from, that business machine, what your role was, and see if you're translating any of that into your current venture? I think one of the, the key things that I think I learned and that I continue to put into practice uh, today is whether you like it or not, whether you're motivated or not, you still got to do it. 
So sometimes I wake up, I'll be very honest with you. Sometimes I wake <coughs> up uh, nowadays and I'm not motivated. I find myself uh, thinking, you know what? Why should I get out of bed? I, it's, I just, no, I, I don't want to. But those are the days that really, I, I don't want to be cheesy, but define you. They, they're the days that define you, whether you're going to get up unmotivated, because the days that you're motivated, it's very easy to get up. It's very easy to get up and you know what, let's go to the office, let's meet the team, let's brainstorm, let's talk about stuff. Do all that stuff when you're not motivated, when you're not in the mood. That, that's what defines you. And you think it was a, like, for me as a kid, I wanted stuff, right? I, I, I wanted to buy something. I wanted to, to save up to buy. So you know what, whether I wanted to go clean dishes or roll croissants or whatnot, it didn't matter whether I wanted to or not. I still got up and I did it. That's what, that's what I take. That's what I take from that. That's the, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you I take the, the, the skill of washing dishes. Well, I do. I mean, ask my wife, but, you know, I, I, still, I still do those little skills. But the biggest thing is doing stuff that you don't want to do. I love that. I love that you're saying that because that's, you know, it's very true for artists as well. So I play guitar and uh, while learning, there is, um, I can't remember the name of the book that I was reading, but uh, it was making the point that an artist needs to treat their life like a professional. Okay. You don't feel like you don't have the muse today to mm -hmm. come up with tunes. Mm -hmm. I don't care. You have to work on it. Yeah. Like you're going to pick up that guitar. You're going to play those notes. You play your scales. You don't feel like it. I don't care. Your fingers are hurting. I don't care. Like yes. you are a professional. Yep. You're not an artist that does work when the muse strikes or when I'm feeling motivated. And I'm, I've definitely felt that in my first two two and a half years of doing that's business as well that's your craft so wake up and do it right yeah uh same thing goes for athletes yeah you know like sometimes i, I ask myself i'm like why don't i go to the gym i'm not motiv motivated but these people that that's their craft mm -hmm. for me it might be different because i'm just going to the gym to have a healthy lifestyle and whatnot so sometimes yes i'll i'll admit it i give in i give in and i tell myself you know what i'll go tomorrow fine but the people that this is your craft, this is your, this is what you're working towards, whether you like it or not, whether your body is sore, whether you, you're in the mood or not, you got to do it. Yeah. Well, showing up is half, half the game, right? Yeah. And, and I, I'll be honest too, like I struggle with it sometimes. And both Alina and I, when we run the business, we wake up some days just absolutely exhausted. Mm -hmm. It'll be Tuesday and we'll be like wishing for the weekend. Um, it's not like we have free time on the weekend. We work on the weekend too, yep. but it just feels different when everyone else, else is not working. But there are days where we just have to push. Yep. And uh, I like I like that you got that lesson early on because I'm certainly learning it a bit Sh <laughs> later. Showing in up life. is showing up is eighty percent of the battle. Yeah. I think I I saw a, a guy um, in a video. I think it was a podcast or something, and he said mm -hmm. something that stuck with me. He said. Uh, he knew a guy that wanted to lose 200 pounds, right? And he was just unmotivated to go to the gym. So what he did was built up a habit of showing up. So he used to go to the gym for five minutes. That's it. Just showing up. He did half an exercise and then he would leave back home, right? Every single day. And then at one point after that became a habit, he started changing that five minutes into 10 minutes, into 20 minutes, into 30 minutes. But he built up that habit of always showing up. And people must have looked at him like he's crazy. What the hell? He's going. He's going to the gym for five minutes. No, but it, it's not about the exercise he was doing. He was. He was. He was building up a mental uh, showing up uh, habit. Yeah. And he built that up, and lo and behold, he he lost his two hundred pounds. He built up his habit. Absolutely. So showing up is eighty percent of the battle, if not ninety. Yeah, maybe maybe even yeah. more. Yeah. Um, I'm going to switch gears now a little bit and go into the bridge of entrepreneurship. So there's a lot of people that we lose on this bridge from okay. going into business. And we all have these people in our life that are, you know, all have the ideas, but never kind of go ahead. Mm. And what you hear is like there's stories in everyone's mind about the pros and cons list and the cons. So you probably have talked about why you did start the business. I want to talk about why you almost did not start the business. When you were doing your pro con analysis, risk analysis, what were the things that were stopping you from going into business? What were the conversations you were having that were forming the anti case of doing it, of not doing it? Um, what was the risk or what was the fear? There must have been, a, I'm, I'm just putting words in your mouth, but there could, was there a fear at that time that you were considering that, you know what, 
maybe it's not just a not a, not a great idea mm, to go into mm-hmm. business what do you remember from that time um i worked at deloitte right so i worked in uh, audit i worked in risk risk versus reward basically and i mean the the biggest risk for anybody is money uh, when you're starting up a business it's money whether it's your own or whether it's somebody else's money that you're taking it's a risk so i mean it i don't know how to put it it, it, it all came down to money once i uh, you know i've i've always wanted to start up this business i've always wanted to start up a business maybe not this one specifically right but it, it was never about funding for me so it was always about changing my mentality of is is the reward worth the risk so i i i didn't i didn't look at it as uh when i was when i was a salaried person i was looking at the money coming in stable very very safe the money keeps coming in i still have my 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 saving on the side i have my family helping me and everything and i could have had the very comfortable life right very comfortable in the sense of i don't have responsibilities i don't have worries i know i'm going to get my paycheck at the end of the month uh whether i succeed or not but is that what i want and then i i i changed my mentality i i completely changed my mentality of shit the the reward of this could turn into it could it could change something and for me it it's not about creating a bit of richness that's, uh, that's not what it is uh there's two things for me that motivate me uh one i want to change the world in the sense of i'm not uh, i'm ambitious but i'm not naive i don't want to change the world uh make it a better place or what but i want to make it more comfortable for people so people that uh, that haven't had the 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 blessing that i've had in the sense of start up your own business that's what i'm doing right now my business allows other people to become entrepreneurs and be your own boss that's what freelancers are right so i wanted to do that i want to give all that power back to the people and you don't have to work for the corporate uh, the corporate job anymore you could be your own boss and then besides that my other motivation is i want to create generational wealth generational wealth which means my kids as kids as kids don't have to worry if 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 they want to roll with a business idea and it goes down south then it's okay you roll on to the next best thing and you try again and you try again and you have that choice i don't want to give uh, my kids or my kids as kids just the mentality of you got to check in 9 to 5 you got to work and that's it so i'm trying to build something that's good for everybody me included obviously right yeah. but it's good for everybody everybody in my field everybody in my uh, industry i think that maybe my mental model is similar to yours in the world that the more value you give the world the more value you get so yeah 100% getting rich is not really an evil thing because you have to do something positive to impact yeah. someone else's life and I'll underscore a few points you mentioned there so you said giving freelancers that ability to control their own life more our business was actually started like that mm-hmm. so Alina my wife was a freelancer she did two okay. clients then went to four clients went to six went to eight yep. until we looked at the numbers together and we said we can take this to the moon yep now that you've uh, perfected your art and your craft now that we have incoming clients mm-hmm. all the time now that we have an operational manual in place yep. this can turn into a business on its own and now we're at the stage where we hire freelancers to do work for yep. us who will in then in that case kind of go up and beyond as well and the second thing about generation wealth maybe we can jam about this a little bit so i started thinking about that too but i'm not very fully clear on how to do it so i had a discussion with one of my friends mm. and um or the husband of a friend and he said with a smile to his face when i told him this he said not you your kids will and what he meant is that it takes a good um level of a base level to get to to have these kind of goals too so my dad you know did well in his life but not well enough that he could look after himself in retirement i'm looking mm-hmm. after him in his retirement so and i was telling him all this the context of like you know how much i support my dependents and i don't have kids but i do have dependents and he said you're going to work hard but you want to give your kids the opportunity to start making generational wealth mm. and that was the first time i got slapped in the face cuz when alina and i talk we talk about financial freedom a lot we're like yeah, yeah 
this is like the average amount we need till the end of our life. This is our monthly expense. Okay, this is much how much we need in the bank. Like, you know, right now I might have five to 10 years, but like it's not 40 years, which I might yeah. go for. And that's when you're truly free. And that's when that friend kind of slapped me in the face. Like, I think you know? <laughs> a financial freedom is not having an Excel sheet for, for expenses. Mm-hmm. That's what it is. I, I mean, it. growing up at university and uh, like I... I used to have an allowance, right? Yeah. And I used to put on the side, used to tell myself in this Excel sheet, I used to be like, okay, you know what? This much is for, is for food on a monthly. This much is for transport. Mm -hmm. This much is for uh, fun. And this much I'm going to put to the side maybe for next month or maybe for a little trip with the guys or something, you know? But once you don't have that Excel sheet, that's when you're finally yeah. free. That yeah. for me is free like all the people that are telling me i've got excel sheets and like I, it's it's not a diss on them at all that's respect yeah. for them i i completely respect that 100 percent because you're trying you're working towards something right you're trying to work towards not having this excel sheet one day that's it you know so it's not at all like an, a, a negative point towards them yeah but i think financial freedom is not um it's not i could sit on my ass and do nothing for six months for 12 months for 18 no it's not about that. It's about not having that Excel sheet. The other phrasing of it, in, in line with what you're saying, so you're looking at the expense side. I, I mentioned Nassim Taleb before we started recording too. Mm. He had this tweet where he said, um, like, F you money is when you don't know how to calculate your own net worth. It's like, if, you, if you've never been able to calculate, like, it's so much that you can't calculate it. Yep. That's what financial freedom is. Yep. That on the expense side, you don't 100%. know what's going on. But on the positive side, too, you have no idea how much you have because yep. you've lost track. Yep. <laughs> that could be... I mean, that's a good problem to have. <laughs> it's honest. a great I problem guess. to have, right? Um, okay, I'm pivoting the conversation. Uh, I'll do this a lot. Have you, have you seen the movie Memento? No. Okay, well, my timelines of how I ask the questions are all messed up, so that's bear with me. Okay. Pivoting the conversation to pivots. So how long has it been since you started Pangea X now? Uh, almost two years. Two years. Would you say that there's been any meaningful pivots in how you do business? And you can take the word pivot in any way you want. It's sometimes it's evolution uh, as a business or an mm -hmm. assumption that was, that was there when you started it, but it's not there anymore. I think I, I take pivots maybe in a different sense, in a sense of lessons, uh, seeing what works and what doesn't work. And then you take a lesson from it and you move on to something else. Um, have I pivoted or have we pivoted as a, as a company, uh, as a whole? No, we, we haven't pivoted because, um, our model is still, is still valid. It's still good. We're building ourselves up we're, we're getting exposure and we, we don't see the need to pivot in a, in a certain sense. However, uh, the products and our development towards the next features coming up, yes, we have. Because uh, initially when you started up, uh, when you start off a business, you probably got a plan for two years, three years, five years, right? And in a sense of a platform for us, we had a timeline or we had a roadmap for the next three to five years of every single feature we want to develop and what we're, we're thinking is good. All right, we'll start with A, B, and then we'll go to C, and then we'll go to D and whatnot. And once we built up A, B, C, and then we started to realize, you know what? We, we're taking lessons from it. So something that doesn't work in C and that would have worked great with D, E, F, then we decided, you know what, that's not the path to go. Yeah, I think the, the thing that we have planned three years down the line, we should bring it up. That, in that sense, yes, we've, piv uh, we've pivoted. We've, we've changed our timelines. We've changed our roadmap. Uh, things that we were planning to do years down the line because it's not, uh, it's not about uh, money, monetizing the platform. Uh, we're trying to get more exposure. We're trying to build up a community. We're trying to build up a, a place, a go-to place for everybody. And if you start uh, with what we had planned, which is, uh, I mean, set the basis for the platform, and then we start thinking about how we monetize this platform, right? But we're not there yet. We're not at the point of monetizing. And that's okay. We, we continue to invest, and we, we, bring, uh, we bring forward things that we had planned for three, four, five years down the line, and we bring it up because we're trying to build ourselves up. The monetizing will come later on. But in that sense, yes, we pivoted and changed timelines, but pivoted as an entire company, an entire product? No, we haven't done your, so. Your mission remains the same. Yeah. How you deliver it. Yeah. 
Can I can I also ask you when you bring things up from that timeline, mm-hmm. something that needs to happen in three to five years, is it uh, a shiny object syndrome where you're like, you know, I want this now, or is it a matter of necessity? If it was just me, yeah, uh, yeah. Sometimes I go down the line of shiny object. You know, yeah. like I want that. That would be great. Bring that up here. Yeah. Let, let's do that this month. Let's do that for the next three, four months. Let's develop it and let's go live. Yeah. But it's not just me in the sense of I have my advisors. I have my team of researchers. I have my uh, my development team. I have my marketing PR team. I have I have all these different teams that tell me different things. Whether I ask them straight up or not uh, about this feature, maybe they're telling me something else and I plug that into my thinking and I mean, I would love to go with shiny object and just bring it up, but sometimes it's not the 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 easiest path or the the most uh, clear path is not always the most logical. Yeah, you need a you almost need a sense check, and yeah. And, and I ask this because like I struggle with this quite a bit myself too, right? And we haven't uh, we haven't done it in a way that we have a lot of people calling out our BS. So Alina and I we call each other out mm-hmm. a lot when we make plans, yep. um, and we're always wondering what do we start now what should mm-hmm. we start later what should we continue doing and what should we stop doing yep and uh, we don't have a formal kind of process around it so this, okay. which is why i ask about pivots is that intuitively yes you know some things then you can get data around it then you need to make that bloody decision of whether to go ahead with a certain thing or not are there any you know apart from outs- outside external kind of sense check that you get do you have any internal frameworks of picking and choosing what you want to be investing your time in next the next three months the next six months how do you prioritize your own shiny objects in a certain way that you feel comfortable that because you can have sense checks from other people but sometimes Mm -hmm. you feel so strongly about an idea that you go and sell it and you sell it hard and you back up your intuition with data or whatever but how do you do that for yourself how do you sell an idea to yourself and prioritize I mean, for for us, when when we want to develop a new uh, a new feature, mm-hmm. we try and get data behind it. And for me, data is the now decisions are data driven. I'm no longer like my my father or my grandfather or my great grandfather where we they used to go by gut. You know, I have a gut feeling this is going to work. Let's go for it. Let's do this. Let's you know, it might have worked out well for them, but <coughs> I mean, for me, if I have data that backs up my decision, then that's what I go with. So if I have uh, an idea that I want to go for, we'll do research. We'll do market research behind it. We'll do user research. We'll talk to user, get user feedback and be like, what if we brought something like this without giving away the, the cake, you know? But we ask them certain questions and we get that data back. And if we get uh, 90% or 80% or even 75% of the people saying, yeah, that's great. That would make me want to come back to your platform every day. That would make me want to use it. Even if uh, I'm not spending money, I would log on just like Facebook and just go through the posts and see what's going on and whatnot. Can you give, the, get, give that example a bit more so I have more, more context about that particular feature? In the, in the feature? Yeah, yeah. Uh, if it's not confidential. Yeah, it yeah. does. Yeah. It's fine. We're trying to build a community, okay. right? Initially, what, what we were trying to do is we're trying to build, uh, we were trying to build a platform where everybody can be their own freelancing boss, right? Freelancers, uh, you, you have this issue of all the admin work. Uh, the payments, the invoicing, all that stuff, and communication with the with, uh, with the with the client, and uh, expectations, contractual, all that stuff. They struggle with that. They uh, freelancers just want to uh, get requirements, do A B C. They do A B C and they get paid and get paid. Yeah, that's it. I want to see the money reflecting in my account, and that's it. I don't want to worry about everything else. So that's where we come in. That's what we do. We do everything else, right? And that's where we started. But then we started to realize, you know what? The, these freelancers, the, the, these people want a community. They don't necessarily need to be, okay, maybe uh, 30 or 40% of their time on the platform. Yes, they're looking for jobs and whatnot. But the other times, they're going onto other platforms because the other platforms gives them the ability to communicate and to talk to people and ask questions and uh, like forums, you know? Yeah. Be like guys, I have a question. It's not a project. I don't want to discuss the, uh, this uh, for a hundred dollars. I just want to discuss. Yeah. And a lot of people are willing to share that knowledge for free. Absolutely, I'm in a ton of Discord and Slack groups. Yes, are, and these these freelancers exactly. definitely are a part of like at yes. least five or ten already. Yes, a hundred percent. So why yeah. not integrate that into what we're trying to do? 
So mm -hmm. we're trying to build that community, uh, build a feature where the communities are no longer on LinkedIn groups or Facebook groups or on Twitter or on, uh, on Discord, like you said, or mm -hmm. on Reddit. You know, why is everybody so spread out? Why can't you have a community where you work? And that's essentially what we're trying to build. Yeah. I can see then uh, the the sales version of you coming out to your advisors be like, guys, <laughs> we need to do this now. I hope they're listening. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's that, that's really interesting because I, I can see the the passion that goes into decision making as well, right? Mm -hmm. Something that, again, is not measurable by data, but yeah. your passion and your, your search for the fulfillment of the platform. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pivoting the conversation again. Uh, you mentioned your advisors in there. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you, who do you call most at 2 a.m. for business advice? 2 a.m. Yeah. Shit, if I call anybody at 2 a.m., <laughs> they'll tell me go away. No. Um. Look, to be to be very honest, I uh, my go-to person is always my father. My, my my father is the the businessman I look up to. He is uh, what I try to try to uh, not imitate, but I, if I aspire to be somebody in the business world, I would I would love to be half of uh, what my dad is he's really succeeded and he's done well for himself and it's not because he 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 just put in the work he loves what he does and that's why you know like i i used to ask him i think i asked him back in high school i did an interview uh it was for a project that we had interview somebody uh somebody that uh, you know or a family member that you look up to and i interviewed my dad and i asked him a question that i never asked him before dad do you like what you do and he told me i, I love it I fucking love it. It's uh, I wake up in the morning and I'm buzzing. I'm buzzing to go to work. I'm buzzing to get on the next flight and and just uh, go see what's going on in this company or that company or what. And he he just loves what he does. And you know the first like three, four, five years of my career, my professional life, I was not waking up uh, happy to go to work. <laughs> to be very honest with you, I was not. So you know, like I I always wondered. I'm like how great would it be if I woke up in the morning and I'm happy to do what I do? And not many people get that privilege. So I, my go-to is my father. Yeah. And if he's not available, then I have to go to anybody else, to our, you know, our other advisors. Do you remember the last <coughs> uh, advice that you got from your dad? And just, just trying to paint a picture of how that relationship looks. Um, do you usually do the outreach? Is there like a fixed time that you guys meet every month? Does he reach out to you asking like, what the hell are you doing, son? Or yeah, how does that, uh, how does that look in your world? I mean, my relationship with my dad is, uh, is very special, like no other. It's not your typical father-son uh, relationship where, uh, where I, I don't know how to explain it, to be very honest, but um, he calls me and he tells me, no news is good news, <laughs> you know? Because I, look, I, I left home when I was 18 years old. That's it. For me, after 18 years old, I was on my own. I was on my own at university. I was on my own after university. I was on my own when I came here to Dubai. I was on my own when I, uh, you know. So, it, like, my family is uh, in Europe, right? Um, sure, they come visit here and there, but I'm not, like, uh, I, I don't have the, the uh, every day I speak to my family. Every day I speak to, to my father or to my mother or to my sister, you know. I, I don't have that relationship because we all have our own life going on. I know my dad's not retired. He's still working. Right? My mom's doing her own thing. My, my sister's doing her own thing. Everybody's got their own things. So I understand. We, we understand each other. We don't take things personally when, you know, like we, we haven't spoken in a week. Right. But my dad picks up the phone and he calls me. He's like, no news is good news, I assume. Right. I love it. I'm like, yeah, that is great. <laughs> Everything's going good. And, you know, we, we talk about business. We talk about life. We talk about everything. But yeah. mo most of the time, yeah, we, we, we bounce ideas off each other. And it, it got to a point where when I graduated, when I had a couple of years under my belt, that he would call me and start telling me what's going on in his work and tell me, you know what, what do you think about this? And that for me, that uh, that wow. changed our relationship. That was like, you know what? My dad doesn't look at me as a kid anymore, and he actually values my uh, my opinion because he he does have some work that that uh, that is in tech, that is in data, and that is you know. So he does tell me he's like, what do you think about that? What what can we do with this? And wh what do you think? Would, would this be a lot of effort? Would would it be worth it? And when he starts asking you these questions, it's not like he he's uh, you know talking to me as a child. He's talking to me as a consultant. You know, he's telling me, what do you think? 
and my opinion and my the the knowledge that I would give him, he would actually act on it. He would actually take it, take it to the bank. Would so, you send him an invoice after? <laughs> uh, my dad's been okay. paying invoices for way too long. I can't send anything anymore. Um, can you remember any uh, the last or the most recent insight that he's given that has helped you in your current business? Just as an example. Um, it was one of those days where, like I was telling you, I was unmotivated. I was completely unmotivated. And he wasn't calling me about that. He was just calling me for something else. I think he was just checking up on me and like, yeah, what's going on? How are you? Everything. And I, I just bluntly told him, I'm like, dad, I feel myself, you know, like uh, completely unmotivated. I feel myself like I'm, I'm here and like uh, with our platform, you look at numbers. I'm always looking at numbers. I have this sickness, you know, I'm, I've, I've got the admin panel always open. I've got the Google, uh, Google analytics open and I'm looking at numbers and I'm seeing, okay, here we got a couple thousand coming in. We got this, we got, we got people, we got people posting projects. We got people uh, bidding on projects and I love to see the numbers. And then some days they're just slow. And you just see the numbers and you're like, is it my internet? Refresh, refresh, refresh. What's going on? You know? Yeah. And the, the, best, the best part of my dad is he, he's mastered uh, an ability uh, that we all should master. And I'm trying to work on it. It's patience. You know, he preaches pr uh, patience to me. He's like, have patience. Maybe one day you'll go up, maybe one day you'll go down, but have patience. You know, when people invest in real estate or stock markets or whatnot, you're, you're not investing for a day. Have patience. Just buy it and let it go. Let it go. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it and go do your own thing. You know, so his advice is always stop looking at numbers. You know, the sickness you have, stop looking at numbers and go, go brainstorm. Even if you're sitting at your desk and just writing on a, on a whiteboard or whatnot, start brainstorming your next features, your next this, your next whatnot. Uh, start talking to people, talk to your advisors, what's going on. Uh, don't sit at your office uh, or your desk and look at numbers. That's the worst thing you could do. So like if you're a, if you're a trader and you're looking at numbers, shit, you're, you're going to go crazy. And I used to do it. I used to I used to enjoy trading just you know at university that's something I used to do just fun you know yeah and oh my god it was like I and because of the time difference with the US and other stock markets I used to wake up at 1 a.m. I've got 2 a.m. Uh, alarms and I'm checking I'm like no okay it hasn't gone up let me go back to sleep no let me wake up let me it, it was a sickness and I've I've kind of brought that sickness into this uh, this uh, venture that I'm on right now always looking at numbers and I'm trying and I'm definitely doing much better than where I was a year ago. And I stopped looking at numbers. Yeah, we have our, uh, our weekly call with, uh, with our teams and we look at numbers. How's it been during the week or whatnot? But that's the only time I look at numbers now. Yeah. I don't look at numbers anymore. Throughout the day, I really try not to. Unless I get an email no a notification or something or somebody sends me something or calls me and tells me, have you seen what's going on? Unless something happens like that, I don't look at numbers anymore. It's a sickness. Yeah. So the best piece of advice, my, my dad calls me recently, uh, six months ago, a year ago, it's always the same thing. Have patience. Yeah, but I, I like how he, he turned that, because patience is a is a motherhood statement, right? It can mean so many things. And it's like telling people to relax when they're like stressed out. Like the worst thing you can do is tell people, hey, relax. Like, no, I'm not going to relax. Yeah, I know. But I like how he tied that into the actual problem, which was the the sickness, as you call it looking at data because i okay i struggle with patience a lot too in different regards but yeah. i've been told to be more patient especially for us we're around the same business age yeah we i'm probably not going to see the actual true rewards until the stuff compounds in five ten years yep. and the game is about survival first and growth second 100%. because if you're not around to play that next hand yep. you're not going to be able to grow 100%. your your hand as well and that's uh that's a reminder that I think is getting easier over time. Maybe it mm. is for you too. And you can tell me too that patience is not something that you work on once and it's done. No. no right. No. Like I, I sense between you and I, there's a general sense of impatience mm -hmm. <laughs> with, uh, with the results. And one of the things I heard was be impatient with action, but patient with the results. Mm. And I try to remind myself that, but it's such a work in progress. It is. It's tough. Well, it's tough. But the best thing that I found is keep busy with something else. Mm -hmm. so like divert that energy yeah, yeah. That, yeah, instead of wasting it for me i i now i've i've categorized that looking at numbers as a waste of time mm -hmm. it's wasting my time my time is uh, is valuable to me and you know, like people say time is money then why should i waste my time and my money 
on something that's not going to change whether i'm uh, sitting here looking at the numbers or whether i'm doing something else and i've always been one to to preach multitasking do more than one thing at once not business wise i'm not saying go open up six different businesses and uh, hope hey, one why of not? them flourishes <laughs> <you know? laughs> but i'm i'm saying within your business within what you're doing multitask do so many different things whether it's uh, okay i'll spend one hour brainstorming with uh, with the dev team then i'll jump on a call and start talking with my uh, with my advisor about uh, let's readjust uh, marketing ads. Where should we uh, should we start looking at a different geolocation? Uh, let's do some research. Let's look at different communities. Let's do. I, I try to do a lot of different things, and part of those different things was the numbers. Now I've categorized that as wasting my time, and I try not to do that. It's you like, have a moment of weakness once in a while, right? You, you just out of curiosity, you open up the numbers and you start looking. Fine. Yeah. If it's a two minute thing, that's okay. That's all right. But if you start wasting your time again, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, then then you're going back down the rabbit hole. It's almost like smoking, right? When you quit it, you got to replace that with something. It's like a drug. Yeah. Yeah. Like Definitely you, like a drug. If you just think of just quitting, that's not going to work. Because mm-hmm. what are you going to do in the time that you're not smoking? So you replace that with gum keep busy. or keep, keep busy, busy yeah. yeah, or take up coffee like I did. <laughs> um, you talked about, <clears throat> so part of your role um, it's almost like you're solo, but not solo, right? Like as the head of the the company right now. Um, and we've kind of jammed about this between Alina and I as well about bringing on external advisors or internal ones or hiring a coach. Um, or like right now we're joining a EO Accelerator program okay. just to have some sort of like a mentorship kind of program, mm-hmm. formal one in place. Because... So far, it's just been her and I and this podcast. Okay. <laughs> um, how how are those relationships for you? Having those advisors are they are they full time in the business? Do they have stake? What what's their relationship to you? No, no one has stake in the company except for me. Okay. Um, everybody is either. Uh, so we 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 have multiple different uh, businesses uh, as a family, right? And uh, some people that are in a different uh, business. I still use as an advisor, whether it's a, it was a, a GM or a CFO that uh, we know that they, they know my case, right? They, they know what I'm trying to do. They know what I'm working towards. So they're there for me. They know they, they, they follow my journey and they know what's going on. So I can always go to them. They're not my employees per se. However, they're there for me. And then obviously my dad, He's, yeah, on a, yeah. he's on a retainer. Yeah, he you know? definitely is. I go to him whenever yeah. I need advice. But uh, somebody that your your advisees could be somebody like your wife. It could be yeah. your friends if they're on the same or similar mental wavelength as you. If they're, mm-hmm. I mean, even people that are employed sometimes give me a, a wonderful uh, like a bit of information and they tell me what. Well, uh, maybe you should look into this. Yeah. And maybe I, I, I didn't think about it. So it's like anybody anywhere that you have in your circle could be your advisor. Yeah. Um, now, for me, the my professional advisors or my right hand or my left hand, the, the people that I really go to are people I surround myself with that um, as an entrepreneur, one thing I, I think is key is knowing uh, your downfalls, knowing what you're not good at. It's not knowing what you're good at and concentrating only on what you're good at. It's knowing that you suck at this. Let me go get somebody that's really good at this, you know? And I've, I've, been, I've been able to surround myself with people that are experts in their field. Whether it's psychology, they, they, they think about the user, uh, the user journey, the user colors, branding, uh, all that stuff, you know? I have no idea. So when I started my company, I thought, you know what? A logo? Shit, logo. Take me two minutes to draw out a logo. That's great. No, not at all. The stuff that goes behind the logo, the font that is used, the coloring, the what it represents, the, you know, it, when you look at a certain color, it gives you a feeling. You know, when you look at red, you either get warning signs or you, you get a stop sign or some people get a love sign, you know. Um, you got to find people that are experts in their field to advise you and what you're, you're really crap at. You know, mm-hmm. so I've been able to admit that I suck at certain things and get people to compliment me, compliment yeah. what I, what I'm what I'm really bad at. Yeah. I and mean, that, it's 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 kind of to your own detriment if you feel like you can do everything because like there's very few people who can do everything um, and do them all well. 
I don't think there is anybody. Right. If anybody claims that they can do absolutely everything on their own yeah. and they're great at it, yeah, yeah. Sorry, BS. I know. It, it's it's very unlikely that that could happen. And um, I'll tell you <laughs> another slap in the face for me. Uh, so I wrote a job description for myself, and I'll ask you if you have one for yourself. I wrote one for myself uh, because I read it in a book. It's called The E Myth Revisited, and one of the suggestions was to if you want to start working on your business, not in the business, start. Mm -hmm writing down what you do okay it was eight bloody pages long wow okay i partially blame the font size is a little big but <laughs> sure. still too long so i took it to a coach okay. who i was thinking of hiring and uh, he looks at it and he's like <laughs> eight pages he's like it should be one hmm. you should do things worth one page the other things either you pretend that you're doing them because mm. you're not doing them well as as you were yeah. saying and second thing is like you're probably not good at delegating and i said there you go check check keyword delegation right how are you finding that for yourself a do you have a job description for yourself and uh if not or if yes uh how do you manage delegation I does it come I, easy to you or i don't have a job description but if i did i can think of one thing that would be on it it's one bullet point that summarizes all of it keep the train going that's it no matter what you're doing, whether it's uh, ideas for the future, whether it's financials for keeping the business going, whether it's uh, innovation and trying to do the next best thing, it, it, just keep the train going. That's my job description. I like it. Um, but It's uh, much shorter than mine. Right? <laughs> it doesn't even take you a page, no matter what font you put on it. <laughs> um, but I think, um, where were we there? Just delegating in general. Delegation. Yeah. Delegation for me is uh, uh, it's one of the the things that I've learned as I go along. I wasn't I wasn't great at it because I'm I'm a very uh, specific person, so I'm into the details. So somebody sends me something, and rather than uh, just saying yeah, it's all right, it's good. No, I'll read the eight page essay and I'll go through every spelling mistake that you've got, and I'll you know I'll put the the feedback on it and whatnot, and I'll go through all of that. Now I've started just letting go of those things because that for me is not what I should be doing. My, what I should be doing is something much more important than looking at spelling mistakes, mm -hmm. right? Um, so for me, I've learned to delegate as it goes along. And now that I've, uh, I, I kind of, I would say that I've reached a good level of delegation where I allow myself to really uh, think about what's next for the business. So the day to day, the, the calls with the developers, yeah, sometimes I will join those calls and I, I will see the updates, I will see the demos of the features and I will see what's going on. But most of the time that I don't need to be there, I'm doing other things. So I have my trusted people that, I, that are leading those teams, you know, my product manager and uh, the, the head of and whatnot, and they will uh, look at those day to day things then for, it allows me and it gives me the time to do other things. And those other things for me are much more important because what, what, is, uh, what is a developer gonna develop if we don't have an idea of innovation, if we don't have a new feature in the pipeline? And when I say we've got two to five years worth of roadmap and features, yeah, some of these features are very high level. Maybe it's just a, a bullet point that says, okay, uh, let, let's develop X, Y, Z, right? But what goes on beneath that? I mean, I get to a point sometimes I'm I'm drawing it out. I've got a little sketchbook and I'm drawing it out. I'm drawing out the screens and I'm like, I would like the user to go from here to there and to do this and to be able to do that. And then that's my job. After that, I give uh, I give the idea to the developers, to the designers, and they make it look pretty and they actually create it. But I'm I, I'm not in the down and gritty and uh, programming. I'm just the idea. I'm the guy that had the idea to go to the moon. Now, how you build the rocket? No fucking idea. Yeah. No idea. Yeah, it's a, it goes back to a few things you mentioned before to A, when we were talking about prioritizing your own ideas and shiny object, it's hard to go fully into them if you're not okay with a couple of things, like letting go, mm. trusting the people that you're letting it go to. Trust, wow. Uh, and the third thing, Maybe I think you partially mentioned this, but I'll give it a different word is imperfection, being okay with a yeah. bit of imperfection. Yeah. And uh, the reason I ask this question is that I have now become a little better at it, but I want you know Alina to watch this episode because I keep hearing this over and over again. Like if you don't start letting go more often, mm -hmm. 
for imperfection and mm -hmm. sometimes there's a trade off but you know when you have trusted people maybe imperfection is not a problem anyway but maybe in the initial phases there is a bit of imperfection 100% deal, right? everybody's human yeah everybody's human we can't be perfect all the time that's okay it's yeah. fine as long as 90% 95% 98% of the of the stuff whether it's an article whether it's a, yeah. a drawing a design or whether the requirements have been met nothing is perfect and that's okay mm -hmm. you, 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 like i'm not I'm not the, I learned not to be the, the, the asshole, basically. The asshole client that always like, I gave you A, B, C, and you just gave A, B, and 98% of C. No, it's okay. Everybody is human, you know? Yeah. We're all, we, I, I started understanding that when I, I kind of, I kind of not had a, uh, an epiphany, but I, I started understanding that everybody has their own battles, you know? Everybody has their own day-to-day -day life going on at home, whether you don't know what's going on in their life. It's okay for your employee or it's okay for your, your, your uh, consulting firm to do something wrong. It's okay. It's fine. You just point it out and move on. And if not, it's all right. It's not gonna, you're, no one's going to die. Yeah. I mean, unless you're going to cost me hundreds of, uh, of thousands of uh, dirhams or dollars, then it's okay. It'll take two minutes to yeah. fix and that's it. You know, yeah. don't like put 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 your effort into things that really do matter. A spelling mistake here and there, okay, it's fine. Yeah, you know, it's it's the leverage on your time, right? Like how well you said your your time is more important, and it's it's like the impact of your time, of your one minute on the business, mm -hmm. is better spent not fixing spelling mistakes. I remember this reading this in the four hour work week uh, and Tim Ferriss. At this point, when he was fully micromanaging his entire business, it was an e-com thing, selling supplements, I believe. And uh, he found a way because people kept asking him, was like, okay, how much should I refund? How much? Should I? He gave everyone like, you have a hundred dollars mm -hmm. for every single transaction to refund. You make the decision. Don't ask me. Okay. If you think the customer is upset, you figure it out if they are right to receive that. And this is hundred bucks. You don't need to ask me anything over. Maybe send me a message. Mm. But he said his workload went from, you know, 80% full to like 20% full. 100%. Which is like give the people, you know, the ability to make their own decisions. Yeah. And the other thing is, tell me this is right or wrong. When you look at a certain thing, like let's say we're looking at spelling mistakes as the example. There's so many things that led you to become good at spelling. Mm. Your entire life, your schooling, from yep. your childhood to your essays that you have for university yep. Yep. to the bank loan that you applied for. And like sure. all those factors have kind of created your hawk eye vision into yep. these things. How can we expect everyone to go through the same life experience to have the exact same cannot, expectations as us? Cannot at all. And it's, it's a constant battle. Like it's easy for me to talk about it too. But when I do get back, it's like something that's like, you know, we'll make a short clip from this like for 30 seconds. And if I don't like two seconds of it, I'll get to my video editor. I'm like, these two seconds, can we yep. change that? Just edit it you know out. what? I'm not, I'm not going to change anything. It's going out raw now. <laughs> Everything is going out raw from now on. You know, I learned uh, when, I was, uh, when I was back at Deloitte. Yeah. Um, when, actually, when I was at university, I was sending emails, right? I'm sending emails to my lecturers, my, 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 uh, my team and the software engineering, my you know, project team, and we're sending out emails all the time. So it wasn't a brand new uh, thing to me sending emails. When I got to Deloitte, a uh, big four firm, they teach you something as simple as how to send an email, right? And you're sending an email to a client because the client's paying you, right? So there's a certain format of doing things. And to this day, I still send emails like that. I still say, hi, uh, whatever your name is, right? Hope you're doing well. And th then I get to the nitty gritty of what I want to say in the email. And then at the end, you'll say best regards or uh, I'll see you soon or whatever it is, right? I still follow that format. I know some people that just, you receive an email. Okay, noted. Thanks. And th that's fine if you're like, if you're just interacting. But for me, it's about building a habit. So I've yeah. built this habit of, of sending emails properly. Always doing a spell check before I uh, click send. Uh, always, uh, sometimes when I'm writing something, whether it's an article or a blog post or whatever it is, like I'll go through the entire thing and maybe I'll take a minute. You know what? I'll go for a walk. I'll come back and then I'll look at it with a fresh pair of eyes again and I'll see it. That is all that was all taught to me during my consulting days. Mm -hmm. Not everybody's like that. And not everybody has the, 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 
the privilege or the curse in some sense of seeing every single little detail and i see that i see i mean you can ask my friends my family uh, my wife i see every single little detail and i notice i notice stuff even if you don't think i notice i noticed it you know and you it's just a blessing and a curse not to bring it yeah, up but exactly. you didn't notice it, i yeah. notice every single little yeah. thing so when it comes to emails or articles or uh you know designs that have a misspelt in the, in the logo or something like i notice that stuff but i've started letting go yeah because it's not worth my time just just pointing out to sarah he reads everything every <laughs> single thing <laughs> I, I do read, I do read, and I do send feedback, but not not directly to them. I send it to someone, and then that someone sends it to them. Um, switching gears again, um, as I do, as my mind works. Mm -hmm. um, I read something, uh, You, I think you had an interview at The National. Mm -hmm. um, something that intrigued me, because I want to have a, a jam session about it, because I'm in both camps about raising investment. Sure. Um, I think you mentioned there that you wanted to be your own money um, completely through and through, mm -hmm. and you had your reasons for it. I so mean, for, I'm, for the time being. For the time being. Yeah. Like, that's not a forever thing? No. I for don't. the time being. Can you tell us your, your theory on, and your thinking on that? Why is that the case? Because I cause I'll also do the anti-case of that. Um, maybe I'll do that first, and then you can respond to this, too. Sure. I feel like I've been told recently that when you take someone else's money, you have a lot more accountability, which means you work your ass off because generally people are more careless with their own money. Ooh, wow. It's, it's true for me. If I was putting my money into a certain part of the business, if I lost it, it would hurt for sure. But if I lost someone else's money, that would they light would a fire under my ass. On a day-to-day -day basis, it'll cause me anxiety, panic attacks, sure, all the deal that comes with it. But that fire under my ass might make me more capable to accomplish certain goals. Again, now I haven't ever raised investment. Okay. So I'm coming at this very hypothetical. Sure, sure. But yeah, how do you think about that right now? And I think exactly what you said, but for your own money. Mm. because when it, I, I feel, I, again, everybody's different. Everybody's situation is different. Everybody's saving number is different. Everybody, everybody's completely different. There's, two, there's no two apples on one tree that are completely the same, right? Uh, for me, seeing the numbers go out of your own account and seeing your money that you could have just sat comfortably on and just, you know what, let me go do my day-to-day -day and not have to worry about anything. Um, seeing that money go out, that's what's making me uh, not panic, but that that's what motivates me. But I think the second part of this is I believe in myself. I believe in my uh, company and what we're trying to do, what we're trying to build so much that I would I don't think it, it would do it justice to allow somebody to come in so cheap because right now, Maybe somebody could come in for a valuation of $1 million, $5 million, whatever it is. That's not what I'm looking for. That's not going to build you your generational wealth at all. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I, I'm trying to build something. I'm trying to build a product. I'm trying to build a database. I'm trying to build a, a, a company of data. Uh, I'm trying to build something so big that if you want to come and take a piece of my pie, you're going to have to pay $10 million for 10%. And the goal is not just selling it all off. I don't, like, you don't enter a marriage thinking about divorce, right? <laughs> At all. So my, I never had that exit strategy. I, I'm not thinking about, okay, somebody comes to me, I'll sell off. Maybe Google wants to buy me and I'll sell off for 10 million. No, that's not what I want to do because the whole point of this is giving, the, giving the, the power back to the people, right? And part of that for me is I would, my goal is to go public so that people can own part of their own business, right? And that's what I wanna do. That's what I'm working towards. That's what I'm trying to build. So I, when I didn't go for it outside investor, I've, I've had offers. I've had a lot of people come to me and tell me, you know what, we can fund you. We can give you, uh, we can give you a million dirhams for 25%. Uh, we can give you $5 million for uh, whatever percent, 51%, I want majority. Um, I've had those offers. Those offers just fuel me even more. They fuel me even more telling me, you know what? I know people want to come in. I know people want to buy in. 
So you're you know on the right what? track. Yeah, let me continue to build up my value so that when I do look for those investments, then I can ask a venture capital firm and tell them, you know what, my valuation is 10 million plus, 100 million plus. I'm not looking at a million dirhams. That's not that's not going to maintain my company for longer than six months, a year max. You know, that's not going to change my life. But when we're looking to expand and we'll look to expand and open up offices in different uh, in different countries in the world and have our own in-house because I've I've always preached outsource because that's that's part of the business. Right. The freelancer, they're all outsourced. Right. That's all. That's what I practice. That's what I preach. So I continue to keep everything outsourced. But at one point, it gets to the point where you're going to have in-house teams. You're going to need them, right? And when I get to that point, I want to have something or an investor that comes in with me that can fuel me for the next year or two years. It's not because I, I'm going to take your $1 million or your $10 million and I'm going to put it in my pocket and say, thank you very much. That's my salary. I don't take a salary. You know, the, the investor, the entrepreneur, the, the, the business owner should be the last one paid. Mm -hmm. That's just my thinking. Maybe uh, other people think differently. I, and I've heard it. I've heard people I've, say, you know what? Yeah. You're the business owner is the person bringing all the, all the funds. They're the ones taking all the risk. So there should be the first one paid. I disagree. You're I, I, I don't. Yeah, I'm like, like you on that sort. But when I do monthly uh, salary payments for employees... I, I, I manage the bank account, so, but my salary goes out to last, mm -hmm. but not at the expense of not paying myself salary. Because okay. the way I've sold it to myself is that um, this business needs to cover my day-to-day -day and financial well-being. Fair enough. And if I don't give myself a salary, um, I'm not going to feel the same. I need that little reward that comes. It's not fair a massive enough. salary. No, it's uh, it's fair. just enough to keep me a comfortable. Like I'll but still look for deals at Care for, but like you know, I still want to pay myself because I don't want to go through. It's really hard running a business. It 100%, is hundred percent. It's it not is, easy. It's not easy. It's not meant to be easy, and we're all kind of masochists and are doing this to ourselves. But that little thing, uh, and some people have told me again. You know, there's. How, how many ever people you talk to, you, you hear that many stories, but they said that, I can't remember how they phrased it, but this this is an investment in your mental health to keep going for another shit day. Mm -hmm. The fact that at the end Fair of the month you get something. Fair enough. Um, but yeah, we've been talking about investment. The other consideration is having another mouth in on the planning and execution. And, I don't do well with that. And keeping tabs and uh, you selling now you have another sale to do mm -hmm. about your ideas right is that yeah. also a that's part consideration of it. against that's part of it especially at the beginning when you're so yeah. fresh and when you're so young and you're just so uh, you're such a young company and you're trying different things and you're learning you yeah. learn from your mistakes and you, you 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 go like i said slightly pivot and change features change this or whatnot um advisors are very different to investors, investors yeah. right if an investor, uh, somebody has a piece, a uh, piece of the puzzle, and they say, you know what, I, I completely disagree. I don't want to have to pull that majority idea. I'm majority. I'll decide what I want to do, and then you burn a bridge, and then your investor wants out and whatnot. Yeah. It's 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 a very tough relationship to to have an investor that's involved. If they're a silent investor, shit, that's great. That's the best version of investor that you can get. Yeah. Right? You do what you want. They're still going to give you the money and they believe in you. That's why they're silent. They, they believe in you. Yeah. An investor that comes in and wants to start dictating things, they clearly don't believe in you. They mm -hmm. don't believe in your vision and they want to impose their own vision onto your company. And for me, I, I wouldn't be able to do that. Yeah. I love having advisors. I love having people to guide me. But somebody to tell me, uh, I don't agree with what you're doing and I want us to go in a different direction. You know, this, this for me is like my baby. I know. This is my baby and this is, I'm trying to build something and I, I, it's going to be very hard for me to give up a, a piece of that puzzle. You know? Especially so at that, this time. Yeah. yeah. And, it's, and so this is why for me, I want to make it worth it. So if I'm going to give up a piece of that puzzle, I, I want to make it worth it for yeah. me, for the business, for, for, for everybody. And if, if somebody is going to come and invest with us, then most 90, 99% of their money is going back into the business. It's going to grow the business. You know, that's the, that's the whole point of getting yeah. an outside investor. Yeah, one of, one of the last things I want to mention about this is it's also 
ties into your reason for getting into the business in the first place. It's such a grand goal. I'll tell you a not grand goal of mine when we started the business or why we started the business or at least for myself. There were three reasons. One mm. is to have the lifestyle. I won't talk about that cuz everyone talks about that. Two is to have money, not the first, not the sure. last reason, but to get the money. 100%. Number 3 was this business needs to be my creative expression into the world. I'm a creative soul at heart and I, I like creating. Mm-hmm. I'm creating a business. I mm-hmm. might be creating music at some point, but this time right now it's music. How do you tell an investor that hey, I don't have a 5 year business plan. I'm just going to be creative about it. Cuz part of being creative is being in the moment. Yeah. Being in the moment means you change directions yep. when you feel like you change directions. Yep. Yes, you sell it to yourself with ideas, but having those kind of discussions like your intuition and putting frameworks as you do like impact effort chart like this yep. is my yep. this quadrant and you know this is the bulls and this is the yep. star I, i don't remember the terminology that i learned in business school but yeah i don't want to do that at this point so i do i do want to thank you for clarifying that putting but, language around that for and, me too and you know when you when you get an investor uh, they might be looking at you as the the piggy bank mm. right they might see great potential for money but maybe my vision is not money right now i'm trying to build something I'm or it's not the only thing right yeah. yeah it's not the only thing yeah. so maybe their vision will be like you know what if you monetize this you could be making so much money which in return tells uh, it, it gives the investor you know what 10% of that monetizing this feature will go to that person right because they're the investor so that's what they're interested in but for me as a business owner i'm trying to build a bigger picture i'm not trying to build you know what i want to give you your dividends by the end of the year and that you get paid well and your invest uh, your investment is worth it a lot of investors get in and they're like you know what i want to see a return after one year i want to see a return after two years that's their only skin in the game right yeah. like just just the money I d- that's yeah that's part of it i mean yeah. somebody that tells you money is not part of it somewhere yeah. somehow is lying to you yeah, right for it's sure. part of it however it's not my big picture that's yeah. not what i'm trying to do and investors maybe don't get that yeah it's uh we've seen a lot of oh, there must be a lot of examples of businesses that got bastardized because you know investors looked at just excel sheets and they said for example from airlines like cut one piece of bread we have so many it's like but that bread piece was so much joy for each customer yeah. yeah um how do you calculate joy but no you know the bottom line um okay switching gears again when did you first realize you're onto something good in the last uh, one or two two and a half years did you, did you do you remember or point to a moment when you're like yes this is i'm on to something good over here this is going to be um, my vehicle yeah um when i started working in uh post deloitte i was working in a very boutique firm for uh data analytics consulting right and what they used to do i'm not going to name names or anything but what what they used to do um is outsource everything right they barely had anybody on their pay- and their payroll they used to go to clients and sell projects and sell concepts and sell everything and tell them yes we could do this yes we could do that and as soon as they got the the project awarded to them they would start looking for freelancers and start uh getting uh, people in and like okay we've already got this project now is when i need to go get the resource to complete this project i started to think to myself like okay we used to do it at deloitte too outsource because deloitte has their own entity in india and the the hourly rate is cheaper in india so they obviously they outsource to the india team it's still deloitte but they're still outsourcing to the india team so we we here in the dubai office we're sitting on a house is doing nothing and they outsource our project to india and they're the ones working and a bigger profit margin for for the office here in this region right so as a business decision great good job so i just for me that was the moment i'm just like everybody's outsourcing everything the hell is going on here nobody wants to to hire an in-house uh, team no one wants to have the the resources uh, from india you could have them here but why don't they uh, they do the in-house thing because when you get a visa when you mm-hmm. got to sponsor them you got to give them insurance you got to give them what not and you don't know if projects are going to keep on coming yeah so whenever you do get one project shit just go find somebody that knows the expertise great let them do the project after that thank you mm-hmm. bye you know so that for me was just like freelancing is the way to go and then you start doing research you start looking at things and you're like 
these people, it's a relatively young uh, industry, right? So mm -hmm. these data analysts don't have a place to go. They really don't have a place to go. I mean, you see them on Facebook groups selling themselves, saying, you know what, I'm an expert in XYZ. I'll do it for a hundred bucks an hour. Yep. They don't have a place to go. I mean, so they're resorting to social media and they're resorting to, to word of mouth. I mean, I used to talk to a lot of freelancers and I used to ask them, how do you get your jobs? Word of mouth. I'm good at what I do. So a client that I used to work with tells their friend and their friend tells their friend and whatnot and so on. So why not give them a place to, to all go to, come together, C come together on the platform, right? Pangea X, your super continent for uh, data analytics. That's what it is. So that's what we did. And when you started and the business started running and you started getting uh, gigs posted and you started getting clients inquiring. I, um, lo I love how you said gigs. Gigs, are they are they gigs? Gigs is uh, no gigs is a very uh, Fiverr. It's term, a Fiverr right? thing. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing with Fiverr mm. and Upwork. You don't look for serious talent there. You look for disposable talent on those on those sites. It's just personal opinion. I, I equate those to more, let's say, even social media VA type of work, versus heavy intellectual work that yep. is probably required for longer term. Well, you you know the expression "too much is like too little." Have you ever heard that? Yeah. Right, I, yeah. I my, my mother used to tell me that a lot. Right, yeah. too much is just I too like little. That. If you're if you're trying too hard, then it's like you're trying you're not trying enough, right? So too much is too little for Fiverr yeah. and for uh, those other big platforms. I mean, you can get couples counseling on Fiverr. Yeah, and are they legit? It's probably just somebody sitting on their couch just writing. You know what? I think you got a couple yeah. uh, problems or whatnot. Okay, pay me a hundred bucks. Yeah. So it, it got to a point where their quality is just, and you can see it in the communities, in the forums, and everybody's talking about it. They're like, I received 200 bids for one job, and 98% of these are crap. Mm -hmm. they, they're people that are either faking it, uh, don't know what they're doing. And so, you know, I realized there's an issue, one, with quality, and there's an issue with uh, validating uh, somebody's word. Nowadays, you can buy anything, right? Yeah. You can buy a, an online certification. You can buy a degree. You can buy your end of year project for uh, for your thesis. You can buy anything. All right. So that was a, one of the big issues. If you say you're an expert in X Y Z, shit, you got to prove it. If you want to, if you want to bid on a project, prove that you're an expert in this. And that's where we we wanted to come in with quality over mm -hmm. quantity. So you might not get the 200 bids on my platform, but you'll get quality ones, right? Yeah, and they're verified. Yeah. Uh, side note uh, for the audience and for you, there's a, there's a little fiction. It's a book, but it's written online as a blog, but it's really long. It's okay. called The Gig Economy. Okay, it's a, I've heard of it. Have you heard of it? Yeah. H.P. Lovecraft. It is, I do recommend reading that twice. Mm -hmm. It is such a dystopian outlook into yeah. this whole, if this whole thing goes wrong, <laughs> what, what yeah. the world will look like and it's True. it's mad crazy the language they use in there oh my god that's for another day i wanted to ask you mm. how do you keep yourself useful in your business in the sense of how do you keep improving yourself so that you remain useful to the business as as the business grows how do you make sure you're growing with it as the founder as the owner i educate myself Mm -hmm. I educate myself in uh, in uh, industries and in furthering my knowledge in uh, in data. I do uh, whether it's online degrees or online uh, certifications or whatnot. There, there, there's so much that we don't know. And I recently did the, the the thing that you mentioned at the start, right? The London School of uh, Economics. I did that, and because I wanted uh, I wanted one because it's great for networking, but two also. It was a great knowledge bank for me on globalization. Globalization was one of the big topics that we discussed. And globalization punches into freelancing. I mean, it's because you no longer have the, the restrictions of borders, right? You're so globalized that somebody in the U.S. can reach somebody in India or somebody in India can reach somebody in the U.K. and vice versa and whatnot. You could get a consultant in South Africa working for somebody in Norway. And borders are no longer uh, a restriction. It's now about, one, what it's always been about, finding somebody to fit my budget, right? 
and you don't need to do the negotiation or whatnot because I used to do that with the with the big consulting firms. They used to go from a hundred thousand to no, you know what? Our budget is eighty thousand, and they say, yeah, okay, we'll give you eighty thousand. And no, actually, our budget is sixty thousand. Keep going down, and you and, and people are okay with lowering their budgets because at one point they're going to start lowering their their quality, right? So if you can find somebody right off the bat that matches your budget, then they're going to match your quality, right? So that, that for me was, it was a learning experience that I needed. So I, I just keep on looking at things that I'm bad at and I'm not trying to master something, but educate myself in things that I'm not great at. Finance, accounting, you know, you, if you want to run a business, you need to be able to read a cash ledger, right? Yeah. You need to be able to go through your cash uh, requirements for the end of the month and be like, okay. Especially if it's your own money. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And you got to you gotta look at things. Okay, yeah, I've got a burnout period. How long can I sustain this? If I'm not profitable, can I keep going for two years, five years, six months? What, what is it? You know, so I just keep educating myself and learning. And as I go along learning things and doing more and more research, I get more and more ideas for more features and it just keeps coming to me. So that's how I keep myself, I mean, useful to the business because mm -hmm. no one else is going to do it, right? Everybody has their day to day. Okay, I'm managing the development team. I'm doing the social media marketing. I'm doing the PR. I'm doing all of that. But no one's going to come to me and be like, Jad, you know what? I've got the next greatest feature for PenJX. No one has. I would love it if, they, if my team is listening. I would love it if you did that. However, it, all, it, it falls to me. I have to be the one with the idea and they implement. So I try and educate myself with what's going on, what's going on in the world, the market, where are we going towards Corona, uh, mm -hmm. COVID, lockdown, all that stuff. And I try and put that into features. Yeah. What can I do next for the business? I think the beautiful thing about that is you're actually getting out of the business to do these kind of activities, which might give your some of your brain cells some relaxing or relaxation yeah. time that you need to have these new ideas. So mm -hmm. we we try to, when we started the business together, we wanted to formalize at least our different roles, me, between me and the found, uh, the co-founder, my wife. Mm -hmm. And we came up with all these areas of the business, right? And one is obviously uh, finance, the other is operations, the other is yada, 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 all mm -hmm. these different hats that we have to wear. And then I put in a box called upskilling, yeah. which is, um, which should have its own, um, um, accounting category within our business too, in, in terms of cash flow, we need to invest. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's one thing we find the toughest to stay because we get into the day-to-day -day of the business so much to take that step away and being like, let's go into learning mode. So 100%. I try to get it at night while reading a book, but sometimes you need a more concentrated effort. Yep. You need an outline of what you're gonna learn, what your goal is, what yep. by the end of this, what should you know? Yep. Or what should you be able to think about? Um, so that's something for me. To I take mean, we back. talked about it right at the at the very start. I asked you, uh, "How's it going?" A little bit slow during the yeah. summer and whatnot. That's your yeah. typical thing. It's a bit slow for everybody because everyone's on holiday, taking their Absolutely. kids or whatnot, right? Yeah. So for me, when something is going slow, we take that's the opportunity time. to develop myself, do some yeah. learning, right? Absolutely. When lockdown happened, that's when Pangea X came out. Yeah. Right. Because we took the the lockdown period to do some uh, some learning, to build up the, the company, to set up everything so that when everybody reopens and starts uh, work again, we're here. Yeah. The first thing in your face is ah, Pangea X. Yeah. They've been working whilst everybody's on lockdown sitting at home. Yeah, you that's know? precisely what we're doing now. Instead of kind of going, uh, giving up right now, because as you said, people haven't traveled for a few years, so they're taking this August very seriously. <laughs> they're, yes. they're really getting the hell out. Um, we are so prepared for September when people come back because we've just taken the time right now to, because we, we find that now after working two and a half years in the business, you work up a certain amount of stamina, just like you do in the gym, right? Mm. You have a lot more capacity yep. to think harder, to think deeper, to yep. work longer yep. on things. And we're like, okay, either we can tune off and do what the rest of the world is mm. doing, which we will for five days, we'll go to Budapest. But yeah. for the rest of the time, it will be, okay, what can I, like this is born out of that too. Mm -hmm. There's more time for me. I just done, I've done, what am I done? How often have I been here, Marwan? Every week, twice a week for the last four weeks? Yeah, so just building up this kind of content that can be repurposed for years yep. And, yep. and used around around mm -hmm. uh, the thing and really investing in that stuff. But um, okay, I'm moving on again, as I usually do. We talked about long-term planning. You've mentioned three to five years. Let's go really micro. 
what does what does day to day look like? Because again, everything I bring up is a semi struggle for me, or or I'm looking to optimize. But day to day planning, what does that look like for you? Are you plan it a night before? Do you wake up, put up I some mean, I, fires? I mean, I have uh, I have my weekly kind of routine. Certain things happen on certain days. And then around that, I just kind of go where I'm needed. And if I'm not needed anywhere, then I take some time to myself and I just start drawing stuff out, thinking, brainstorming, calling people, telling them what's going on here and just do that. And uh, one of my... Uh, one of my father's uh, friends actually told me something very interesting, and I try and uh, I try and put that into my 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 day to day. I don't do it every single day, but he told me never you should be you should never be having lunch on your own. You should be with somebody, not necessarily somebody from your team. Or you should be going and meeting somebody for lunch because a lot of discussions happen over lunch. So. My lunches are like business lunch. I'll go meet somebody from uh, my past colleagues in the past or an acquaintance or somebody that I've met. Or I try and uh, I try and keep busy like that for uh, like my lunches, for example. But for my uh, my weekly stuff, I mean, Monday, I have all my Monday calls. I have my Monday calls with social media and PR. I have my Monday calls which, uh, with the dev team for almost two and a half hours. Every every two weeks, they do a demo on what's going on with the new features, where they've reached, are they up to par. Uh, you have your weekly call with uh, SEO uh, company, uh, my the SEO firm that handles all the SEO and how, how they've been optimizing, the outreach program that they do. Um, uh, all the targeting I have uh, weekly calls with the research team uh, I mean I have weekly calls with, uh, with so a lot of my stuff is either weekly calls or I go meet them in person and my meetings are very informal I don't do the we have to go sit in a conference room somewhere in our office mm-hmm. or whatnot no like come let's uh, let's have lunch let's have uh, let's have coffee let's meet up and tell me what's going on where are we I mean, every two weeks we meet with the accountant and we see where where everything is going, what's going on. Let's prep for the end of month. Let's uh, pay uh, our <laughs> invoices or whatnot. And I mean, I always have my my weekly routine, let's say. But then all throughout, I have a lot of time where I can go where the flow takes me, mm-hmm. where I uh, where I'm needed, where I'm required. Sometimes there's an issue and we need to jump on a call with the product manager and you know, she's like, uh, we've got an issue here. We got to think about what's going on, this or that, and putting out fires where fires come up. Uh, I mean, it's was this was this there from the start or this is something that kind of evolved into what yeah, it, it is today? Oh, no, it was more chaotic at the start. <laughs> Shit. Yeah. Oh, my God. Every day was something different. Jad this, Jad that. I would wake up with three, four, five different missed calls, and everybody's calling Jad. What's going on here? What's going on there? Yeah. Now everything's kind of died down a little bit, where in the sense of uh, they know that they don't need to go to Jad every single time. Yeah. They have their assigned line managers or whatnot. They have the product manager. She's always there. You go to her first, and then she can come to me, tell me what's going on. Yeah. I have my other teams, and so like uh, people know you don't always have to go to Jad. If you go to Jad. It means the world is burning. Yeah. Right. But unless the world is burning, Jad doesn't want to know. No news is good news. Yes. There you go. No news <laughs> right. is good news. Thanks, Dad. Yes, sir. <laughs> I want to talk about time management too, because that's a part of this as well. Do you feel like you've become better at time management, like deriving the most, or just looking at time in a different way? Because I'm I'm going through this right now, from the last two two and a half years in terms of assessing how much time I should spend on something or if I should at all. And this also ties to um, second part of the question is, are there things that you've become better at saying no to versus when you first started? So what are your thoughts about time? How do you view it now and and saying no to certain things, people or opportunities? I think knowing your value, knowing your value really defines uh, your time. So if you don't if you don't believe or you don't think this opportunity coming or this meeting with somebody or this uh, whatever it is is worth your time and worth the the value that it's going to bring back to you if anything then you should know how to say no. Don't 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 worry about hurting people's feelings because they wouldn't think twice about saying no to you. That's yeah. that's my way of thinking. Like uh, when uh, when somebody uh, invites me somewhere and I I really don't want to go to be very honest with you 
I don't know anybody there. I don't find any benefit to it. There's no friends there. There's no business opportunities there. Why am I going to waste three hours of my evening? Mm -hmm. And they all you have know? coffee breath. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Which reminds and me, I should like, never never ask you out for coffee because <laughs> now I know to take I mean, you to lunch. No, everybody <laughs> always coffee. says, Jad, you want to go for coffee? I'm like, yeah, I'll come. I'll watch you drink coffee. I'll have a juice or something, but no coffee for me. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, knowing your value is is mm -hmm. a big piece of the puzzle. Yeah. So I've uh, I've uh, I've gotten to the point where I'm less worried about hurting people's feelings. Yeah. And you know, like if I always ask myself if the if the tables were turned, would they do the same thing? And most of the time, people don't give a shit about you. You know, to be very honest, no one gives a crap. So if they do, don't feel comfortable in a certain situation, they're gonna say no. So mm -hmm. why should I force myself and and uh, waste my time? I yeah. have other things to do, right? There's there's never uh, sometimes like sometimes people might see me on my desk just staring at the screen, right? And they might be like, sh sh "What is Shad doing? He's doing nothing. He's not busy, right? He could be doing something else." Yeah, but you know what I'm doing when I'm daydreaming, or mm -hmm. it looks like I'm daydreaming. Mm -hmm. I'm planning out so many things in my head. I'm planning out how I'm gonna pay everybody. I'm planning out what I need to do in the next two days. I'm planning out the, my yep. next idea. I'm planning so. So just because you see somebody just sitting there and just thinking, or maybe with an open book and just like doodling, right, doesn't mean they're doing nothing. So there's always something that I can be doing. So my time my my time is very valuable to me. Yeah. And for me one of the key things that I found is less sleep. Less sleep for me gives me more time so I I have personal things that I love to do, right? I'm passionate about uh, about basketball. I love to watch NBA, but I I watch it live so I'm you, you stay you up know. late for that. No, I wake up early. Oh, okay. All right? So I, I'll go to bed uh, around 11 or 12, and then I'll wake up by 4, 4.30, 5 uh, a.m. watch a game. And my team might notice that they start receiving emails at 5 a.m. in the morning, right? And now, now you know why. And <laughs> we, ha we have a, a colleague of ours. She's actually on holiday in, uh, in Canada, right? So she's sending emails at like 3, 4 a.m. thinking she's not going to get a reply. But I'm there sending okay. a reply at 4 a.m. in the morning. So she's probably wondering what the hell is going on. Yeah. But for me, that time before the entire world wakes up and starts calling with problems and telling me what they need to do or whatnot, it's me time. So I'm not just sitting there watching NBA. I'm sitting there watching NBA and going through my phone or my laptop and my, I'm answering emails. I'm planning my day. I'm going through. So multitasking and less sleep. Less sleep has given me so much. Man. Uh, I'm a baby like that, so I, I need my eight, nine hours. Really? Um, yeah, I feel super cranky and uh, really low energy if I go a couple of days with six hours sleep. Really? Maybe it's just my body. I need to change but something, I mean, though. Never go from one extreme to the other. Right? Yeah. So if you're doing key eight, eight hours every day, yeah. go down to seven Minimum hours, eight hours. Seven hours, uh, 30 minutes. Seven hours, 45 minutes. Uh, yeah. Just keep going down to a point where you feel comfortable. But for me, honestly, yeah. I get so much done. Yeah. I get so much done with less sleep and it's worth it to me. It's really worth it to me. Can and I if tell you, you something do a power though? nap, do a power nap. So that's what you're going to hate me for. I do the eight hour sleep and I do power oh naps. Oh my God. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm a baby like that. And it usually happens this way, right? Like you're talking, I really relate to what you're saying about looking like you're doing nothing. So mm. I, I do that in bed uh, at two o'clock <laughs> in the afternoon when I have a food comatose. Okay. So I'd be like staring at the ceiling uh, and just doing all these calculations in my mm, head. Like, mm. okay, this is, this is the that, this is the this and this and that. And then a 20 minute nap. Mm. <laughs> and the funny thing is sometimes what happens is I go to the nap with a question. Okay. You wake up with an answer? I wake up most times if I have the intention of finding the answer, I wake up with clarity. There you go. And it oh. happens at night too. Like if I go to bed sleeping and thinking or meditating on a question yep. about what to do, because I like to sleep over things mm. and I like to give time for the ideas to ferment in, in yep. the mind or, yep. Yep. or all the cases show up and it works, works really well. So 100%. my napping is justified. <laughs> Honestly, there, 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 there's a theory. Uh, I don't remember what the theory was, uh, the name, but there's a mm -hmm. theory of you do your best thinking or the epiphanies come to you, or the brilliant ideas come to you, right in this in this little thing in between your 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 sleep, your and wakefulness your awake. and your yeah. sleep. Yeah. So when you're on the edge between both, you're in the middle. That's when you, something comes to you. Yeah. That's when something really uh, the questions that you have, the answers will come. I can't remember who it is, but there is a scientist. 
I don't know if it was Darwin. It wasn't Einstein, but there is a trick they used to do. They used to um, fall asleep on a chair that's kind of tilted, mm. and that had a bell. Okay. So they try to take a nap that way. Yeah. And uh, it so happened that when they fall asleep, something would rock. Yeah. And the up. bell would hit. And yeah. so they capture yes. that that's, state. That's right the same in theory there. that, I, uh, that yeah. I'm talking about. Yeah. And they get those insights in that. Like, yes. Blip yeah. of a moment 100%. that happens. Yeah. I haven't gotten that extreme. No, just, me neither. Just, Not yet. Uh, yeah, <laughs> maybe soon. I look for my uh, for my guardian angel in my dreams, <laughs> Irene. If you can hear me, I've given her a name too. <laughs> um, we are close to wrapping up. I have a few more things to check with you. Okay, We've gone almost two hours. Wow. Um, I would be, or Sarah would not like me if I didn't ask this question. So this one's for you, Pangea X. The hell does it mean? <laughs> the name? Where did it come from? Yeah, where did it yeah, come from? Yeah, I get from? that pretty often, actually. Yeah. Um, the name comes from the the history, uh, billions of years ago, right? You you know the 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 theory or the the science behind it. There was the tectonic plates below uh, below the uh, the Earth's uh, surface. Basically, they move. That's why there's earthquakes, volcanoes erupt, or whatnot, right? And because billions of years ago, everything moves by like maybe one centimeter a year or one millicentimeter a year or whatever it is. We were all one continent. It was one super continent. There was no Africa, uh, North America, South America, Europe, Asia. We were all one. There was no ocean between us. There was nothing. And that super continent was called Pangea. Oh. So that one place where everybody was connected, everybody was not separate. That's where the name comes from. Okay. I want to be that super continent. And what's the X for? It's the X is for the X. data. You're the X factor. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? When I first read it, I thought it was, should I Google this? Or then I thought of Google. I'm like, Google doesn't have a meaning. <laughs> so it's probably one of those names. But yeah, you've educated me today. Because I, I thought of Panacea. I'm like, it's not that. I know, I know he's solving a problem. Mm. But Pangea X. <laughs> um, I want to ask you, about changing core beliefs. So mm -hmm. part of running a business or starting a business is a philosophical shift in how you live life yep. or how you view view life and your time on earth and your purpose and everything differently. So around that time, your software up here is mm. constantly being updated mm. about certain assumptions that you've held in the past mm. that you thought were you or part of you. Yeah. Um, and I've had a, quite a shift in, in a few core beliefs, like okay. for example, even being competitive way more competitive than I ever used to be okay. in every area of my life. Fair enough. Shift happened. I just wonder, do you can you point to some core beliefs that you've shattered since uh, since you've gone into entrepreneur? Are you mostly the same with a different flavor or is there has there been a shift in just the way your outlook on life has um, has it evolved in I, certain ways? I think I'd like to say that it's it's remained the same in a sense uh, but it shifted a little bit. Um, I've always been competitive. Anybody that you ask about Jad, whether he was uh, back five years old, 10 years old, uh, 15 or 20, or even uh, this year, I'm 30 years old right now. I do things to win. That's just how I am. So even if we're playing little card games at home or uh, I'm playing uh, video games or something, or I'm, uh, I'm doing something with the friends or we're playing basketball, S somebody tells me, we're not keeping score, what do you mean? What do you mean we're not keeping how do you know who wins and loses for me it's always been about winning right but then my um, the the shift that i i would say that i've had is um i'm not afraid of loss anymore i was before but loss is not a weakness right i've lost uh quite a bit in certain different battles uh being a business owner but don't be afraid of loss because with loss comes lessons Right, you can learn a lot from your losses. You can assess your loss and be like, "What did I do wrong? Why did I lose?" And you look at the things that you did, and you're like, "You know what? I could do a lot, a lot of things better." And as a kid growing up, you'd be so afraid to lose because you'd feel like a loser, or you'd be like, "You know what, man? I did the same thing last time and it worked. Why didn't it work now?" Right? And I think I brought that. I continue to bring that until I became a business owner. And when I became a business owner, I started looking at losses as like almost a blessing in disguise because every time I lose at something, it gives me a new path. It tells me, you know what? Try this path. Try going down this road. Maybe something great will happen over there. Mm. 
And now you know what not to do. Yes. Right? You, you, you're always worried about what you should do. Okay, but when you do something and you lose, now you know what not to do. It's not like you wasted your time, right? Now you know what not to do. So you don't repeat the same thing and you go down a different road. I mean, so in, in that sense, I've always been competitive, but I was afraid of losing. Now being a business owner, I'm not that afraid of losing. Yes, I'm afraid of losing the big picture, obviously, right? But the small little battles, I'm not so afraid of losing. I actually cherish them. Yeah. I don't want to say I would, I would love to lose more often, right? Yeah. But I, I think good lessons come with a lot of loss. Absolutely. Um, I, would, I have been the opposite of you. <laughs> so, and uh, my wife is like you. She's super competitive. Okay. Whether we play board games, yeah. playing FIFA on PlayStation, yeah. whatever yeah. it is. I used to say like, hey, this is fun. And mm. she's like, what do you mean fun? <laughs> Where's the fun? I'm like, it's fun. And I play a game of football five years ago, come mm. back. And she's like, how was the game? I said, I had a lot of fun. She's like, did you win? I'm like, no. She's like, how? What do you mean you had fun? I said, I got a workout. I met my friends. Uh. She's like, but did you win? And I'd always be content to be around the people that I was playing these games okay. with. I was the guy who was not keeping score. Yeah, yeah, so I was okay. probably the guy Fair annoying enough. him. Like, <laughs> keeping score. Because I was like, this is so much fun. But something has changed though. Like recently I've become more, a bit more anal about winning. So on the football pitch, I'm the loudest guy now. Mm -hmm. Shortest and the loudest. Yelling at my team when we're not doing well. Yep. And they hate me for it. And uh, card games too. Alina surprise. She hates me now because she. I used to let her win. Yeah. Because it didn't affect me as much. But it's changing now. But when you think about loss and you're when you're talking about loss is viewed as the end game too right sometimes mm. like that's the end but i've also it's good that you brought it up is making me think about how it's not a zero-sum game anymore right like and i'm trying to include that into my life more often than not that yeah. um, it doesn't have to be one person's loss is another person's win yeah uh, one person's loss can be that person's win yeah, yeah. as Definitely. well um, but in the heat of the moment when shit's going up shit's Greek. Yep. <laughs> Things are going up there. It's hard to remember, but uh, you know, if you can justify that to yourself, because you know what? At the end of the day, this is what I tell Lena or she tells me, we're not going to be on the street anytime soon. Mm. No matter how much we mess up, mm. no matter how bad things get or how bad the summer gets, yep. very far away from going on the living on the street. Yep. Very, very like, Count luckily, kind of thing. luckily, you know, we've privileged enough to say this. Yep. Um, but yeah, um, I have a rapid fire round if you're up for it. Let's, Let's do it. See what I do to start wrapping things up. I hope I don't say anything I regret. Oh boy, you're in the hot seat. Let's go. Uh, let's, let's start with the hardest one first. You ready? Ice cream or gelato? Gelato. <laughs> right. Okay, this one's a bit more difficult. Exciting flexibility that leads to volatile results or boring consistency that leads to sure results? No, exciting. Yeah. Definitely. With the volatility? Yes. All right. Okay. If you weren't living in Dubai, where mm. would you be? I really don't know. I mean, from the, the places that I that I visited, Singapore or Vancouver? Singapore, Vancouver. Yeah. I've never been to Vancouver. I was in Canada for 13 years. But I, I, I struggled a lot with that question because I don't see myself anywhere else. I've done it. I've, I've lived a lot everywhere else. I've lived in Spain. I've lived in France. I've lived in the UK. Uh, I mean, I spent a lot of time in uh, Lebanon. I spent a lot of time in Canada. In Canada being Quebec, Montreal, and uh, so on. Not the real Can. <laughs> but I don't see myself there. Yeah. I don't see myself there, and I didn't see myself anywhere but Dubai. Dubai nice. is home now. Yeah. yeah. It's good. As third culture kids, it's very hard to define homes. I'm glad. I'm also making my way there. I think it's becoming home now. Um, favorite TV show of all time? not released this year mm, 24 Do you know 24 I jack remember, bauer i remember 24 yep. that's that's old school 100 uh the one book every business owner should read and caveat doesn't have to be a business book rich dad poor dad it's kiyosaki yeah rich dad poor dad you ever read it a couple of times a couple of times there was there I read, was i read it a couple of times and i got into the point where um every time i read it there's just something that i missed last yeah. time Right. So now sometimes I don't have time to read. I put it on an audio book. Yeah. And when I'm driving or sometimes I just I yeah. just put it up and I start listening. 
and his insight on life and on how he does things or what he learned growing up and yeah. it's just it's one of the the best books honestly so i read it twice i wanted to read it the second time because i didn't find the value the first time around okay um maybe because books have to find you in a certain place in life too right like, i was going to say when did you read it i was too young yeah i was okay. way too young to understand the concepts okay but it was a great gateway drug okay into similar kind of books yeah uh i throw in a recommendation um i think you'll enjoy is the richest man in babylon okay i don't know that one it's same principles were done in written in a Different fiction okay. fictiony way fables okay. like every chapter is a small fable okay but it's got very similar lessons in okay. there okay if you were to stop working in data <laughs> what would you be doing uh probably restaurant business i love food yeah i love food food is my weakness i've always wanted to franchise something that uh, from uh, from back home from in canada uh it's a chicken shop it's very simple but you can only find it in uh in canada in quebec fried chicken um no rotisserie chicken and they have i don't know if you know but in quebec there's a special uh, dish called poutine oh, right yeah. I've always wanted to franchise them but they always they only do franchising within Canada within uh Quebec. They don't do outside and they are super successful and it's just it's the simplest thing, you know? And it's not about making the money or anything but it I I would eat that shit every day. <laughs> uh even for breakfast yeah yeah <laughs> i would make an exception and have breakfast <laughs> breakfast poutine yeah no my my lactose intolerance doesn't allow me to have <laughs> poutine anymore but i used to love it yeah. um last question for you jad mm. uh if you were to put something on a billboard on sheikh zad road mm. you had a message to people in general and it can't be commercial can't be sign up to penji x and okay. post jobs okay uh what would you want to tell my audience or the world business people non business people is there anything that you'd want to share and tell or open people's eyes to or bring attention to quality might not look the same to everybody but everybody has their own quality you know like uh it doesn't matter what brand you represent or company you represent mm-hmm. um just cuz you might not have a big name doesn't mean you don't have quality just cuz you're not the the Louis Vuitton and the Chanel and what not doesn't mean your bags suck right yeah um so quality might look different to everybody but everybody has quality i love it yeah, yeah it's a it's a good uh, good way to get into some satwa food joints too <laughs> like no some of that stuff is so good yeah um but man i've taken tons of notes there's there's lots for me to chew on there are things that i wasn't able to get into which is kind of convenient for me to bring you back in in a few okay. months from now Happy uh, but yeah i think there's some great uh, i like the way you it it sounds to me mm-hmm. that these things are important to you the things that we discussed because you've had thoughts around them and i'm really glad that uh, you're able to give those words to some thoughts i might be having so i'm very thankful thank you for that and uh, this has been fun yeah definitely thank it you so much it was very fun and i know not to ask you for coffee maybe lunch <laughs> sometime juice or something yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah let's do or lunch juice. yeah let's do lunch all right anytime cool man thanks so much thank you See you around.